Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, the end of the homestand was not the same as the beginning. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. And Matt, uh, the wheels fell off this week, I think. Yeah, it's one of those things when it rains, it pours. And the Flames are now missing a couple of blue liners. The team's on a four-game losing streak. Everything seems to be going wrong with the team. Uh, Lost offensively, lost defensively. Uh, The only bright spot this week has been the play of Jacob Markstrom. Well, let's jump into these games that uh, the Flames probably wish they had back. The first one being November 1st as the calendar turned over and the Seattle Kraken in town. This should be one that we're putting on the calendar as a win, I think, when Seattle's in town. But uh, the Calgary Flames end up with a 5-4 loss. Yeah, not a good effort by the team. Um, Just lack of mental discipline. They were awful in the first period here. Oh, yeah, and it it reminded me a lot of the Buffalo game where, like, the Flames clearly took Seattle casually, and they battled back, they got a 4-2 lead, and then they stopped playing because, oh, this team's easy, and then, oh, magically you lose. And it's just the lack of mental discipline that cost them this game. We did see a number of changes to the forward lines in this game, and that was one of the uh, one of the discussions going into this one. So the forward lines, as they were played for the majority of the game, there were a couple of tweaks on the uh, on the special teams and whatnot. But the first line was Huberto on the left with Kadri in the middle and um, Mangiapane on the right. Then the second line was Lucic with uh, Lindholm and Toffoli. And then we had Dubé with Backlund and Coleman, and the bottom line was Lewis, uh, Rajichka, and Richie. Yeah. So very and, different look for this one. Yeah, and I, I thought the the player that actually played the best at, throughout this week, by and large, uh, was Milan Lucic, and like he stepped up into the second line role and actually played like a second liner. Um, his line mates didn't. Um, I want to come back to Lucic in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, the lines just, ev- it basically took a, a team that had two lines that were playing well and then scrambled them so all four lines weren't really playing well. I think that's fair to say. And we saw uh, the same scrambles um, the next night. So after the Seattle game, Calgary had their first two-game losing streak in a row, which extended to a three-game losing streak on November 3rd when the Predators beat the Flames 4-1. to one. Yeah, this game reminded me of the Halloween game from a few years ago uh, when, like, Kachuk scored that ridiculous overtime game-winning goal. Um, in the first two periods of that game, the Flames were beyond a tire fire, and... Uh, this game against Nashville, it was equally bad. Uh, like they couldn't make even basic passes. Uh, nothing worked at all. I know you wouldn't think this in the score sheet, but I'd say that Markstrom was really the only good flame in this one. Yeah, I agree. Uh, he, he was great in both games. And like, frankly, he's the only reason why the flames even have a point, uh, this week. Uh, cause frankly, the flames with their lack of ability, on the ice to get anything going. Like if they were playing a more high powered offense with either uh, Seattle or uh, well, all of the games, frankly, uh, you could have seen like an eight or nine goals against kind of performance. And Markstrom was the only thing that stood in the way of that. And flames were, they look like a team, frankly, that's in the Eric Bedard sweepstakes this week. Like, it, it was bad. Well, the last game, I guess the least bad game of the week, if you will, the uh, Calgary Flames hosted the New Jersey Devils for Hockey Night in Canada. And then, uh, there's a Hockey Night in Canada matchup if I've ever seen one. And uh, the Calgary Flames scored first, but ended up getting down quite substantially in this game, but they managed to squeak by and get one point with an overtime loss in a 4-3 loss to the Devils. Well, you see, the Hockey Night in Canada went to hell for this matchup. You see, the Flames versus the Devils. Makes sense. 
Like, Kadri um, scored first, and you should be happy at that point. And then within, what, like five minutes? No, about ten minutes. It, yeah, down Connor Mackey um, happened, and... Yeah, uh, like, f- frankly... Now, to flame- Mackey's credit, he looked better in the second and third. Yes, but um, that first period was a situation where, it, you know, like, he just simply needs to be better. Um, like, uh, there's no excuse. He was res- directly responsible for two of the three goals, and he could have possibly got there for the third one, too. And, and you know what, Matt? If... If Michael Stone didn't get hurt, I think he wouldn't have been. He would have probably had his butt stapled to the bench. But you can't get yeah. down to four defensemen. No, and it's one of those things where it's unfortunate uh, that he played that poorly because after that point, the Flames were the better team uh, through Tool overtime. Um, and if it wasn't for like those glaring mistakes in the first period, like the flames probably win this game easily. Uh, but you know, you can't, you simply just can't have a guy allowing skilled forwards to just walk in on your goalie. It doesn't matter which goalie that though, all three of those goals were, would have went in. And, you know, to his credit, Markstrom made a whole bunch of other really dynamite saves throughout the game. Daryl Sutter even said the Markstrom was excellent in this one. Yeah, the, that was probably his single best game of the season, which is surprising when you, you see a 4-3 final. Um, but, yeah, it, it's one of those things where it's like the forwards don't know where the defensemen are going to be, the defensemen don't know where each other are going to be, and the, like everybody just is lost out there which makes virtually no sense because there's only a handful of guys that are different from last year and the system and the coaching staff are the exact same. And it's like, you guys did not forget how to play hockey magically over three months. Um, you know, like some of these are basic mistakes and I agree, you know, like it's fundamentals basically that, and it's been like sit throughout the losing streak where, it, it's like this isn't even like remotely competent like AHL level defense of structure. It, it, it's just weird seeing a team that's got a very defense minded coach and approach uh, having this much difficulty, you know, even knowing like where other players on your team are at any point. Well, let's come back to that. Let's wrap up this week first, and then let's chat about maybe where things went off the rails. Um, So with that, the Calgary Flames are now 10 games into their season. They've won five, lost four, and have won overtime loss for a total of 11 points, which puts them fifth in the Pacific now uh, with 11 points behind Edmonton at 14, L.A. at 15, Seattle at 16, and Vegas at 22. So not probably where we expected the Flames to be, not where we expect Seattle to be, but they, they're at where they're at. And Matt, you were just saying here, you know, some it's, it's interesting to see this team looking like they're struggling. This is a very veteran team. And yeah. maybe, I'm, maybe I'm underestimating things, but I assume there's a veteran NHLer, a guy who's been around the league as long as Huberto or Kadri or Toffoli or, uh, you know, B- Coleman or Lewis or Lucic. Yeah, you might not know exactly everyone's tendencies, but I would figure that at that point you should be able to quickly adjust to whoever the coach puts you out with. Yeah. If you're Adam can, Rajichka, the, maybe have a problem, but... The only guy I can really see having a genuine problem generating what he normally does is um, Jonathan Huberto, just because of the fact that Florida's system is was basically built around him and Barkov, and so the players were selected to fit around how they did things. And now he's learning where he has to put pucks when he's making passes because he's not familiar with both the system and um, where, like, you know, going from uh, his line mates last year to Lindholm and to Foley, who are both right handed shooters. His uh, line mates last year were both left-handed shooters, so passes have to go to a different spot. 
and he's just not familiar yet. But even with then, that. as a top so, player, I think you're, you'd be able to adapt to that pretty easily. Oh, and he probably will. Sooner and I could than see later. if he got traded here mid-season, but he also had a training camp to figure some of that out. Yeah, well, uh, when we first acquired Dougie Hamilton, um, it was very much the same story where for like the first two months of the season, like he wasn't making passes. He wasn't being assertive, jumping in the play, and, and looked lost uh, for, frankly, the first two months. And then once he figured it out, he played at the normal Dougie Hamilton rate that he has ever since. And it, it's just one of those things that, like, Huberdeau's never been traded before, just like Hamilton never has been traded. And it does take some time to adjust. And, you know, so that's, like, the only guy out of the whole group that I, I can say, like, his struggles make a little bit of sense. Everybody yeah, else. Yeah. Okay. Though, I can see. I can see his, but he's been not been the only guy struggling this week. Yeah. I know. And that's where, like, uh, Kadri has been great. He's pretty much the MVP of the team and the only guy consistently good. Uh, he's basically playing the way that you would expect a veteran to play. Uh, okay, I'm on a new team. I'm just going to play my game, and he's been rather successful. He leads the team in points. You know, they, he's doing everything that he's supposed to, but, like, everybody else just seems completely lost. At, you know, like, um, Elias Lindholm has been terrible this year, which, like, he was not a product of Gaudreau and Kachuk. Like, he had success before he got here, and, like, it makes no sense where, like, he's not getting to the places that he normally does. He's not playing defensively the way he normally does. He's not hitting the way he normally does when he, because he, he doesn't gauge physically when opportunities present. He's just he looks lost out there entirely. Which well, and it's such a like last year. I think he was one of, if not the best centerman in the league. Like I think mm -hmm. a lot of people took notice of him last year for the first time outside the Calgary market, and he's gone from that to almost the complete opposite. Uh, put it this way, his level of play thus far has been worse than what Sean Monaghan did last year for the Flames. And Monaghan was bad. And you can't even say that Lindholm has lesser line mates. No, he, he literally has like two very excellent players on his lines most of the time. And like even Lucic, has, when he's been on that line, uh, if you're saying, oh, well, he's been on that line, so therefore... Uh, that is an excuse, but Lucic has been by far the best player on that line whenever he's been out with those two. Isn't it kind and, of funny that our best players are Kadri and Lucic? Uh, that doesn't surprise me. Um, Lucic, he, his foot speed, look, especially his first step, looks a lot better this year. I would not be surprised if he has a very successful year this year with the Flames. So, um, it, It's just one of those things where... Like, basically, I'm hoping that with them going out on the road for, like, most of the next, like, three weeks, that they can kind of get out of their own head, uh, because it, it seems like everybody's trying too hard to be perfect all the time, and, like, everybody's gripping the stick way too tightly, and just snake bit. Like, we saw that in the playoffs last year against Dallas, where uh, both Kachuk and Toffoli through the first six games were both snake bit uh, because Ottinger just kept robbing them and it took a goal finally for both of them to uh, you know unlock themselves a bit and like the whole team seems like they just need one of those stupid bounces to go in and it'll click it over it's just that like they're just shooting themselves in the foot too much like blowing leads in the third period or Eight Not games at home was a lot of games. Yeah, I agree. And, and and I think some fans don't realize, you know, what that actually means. Like these guys are at home, they've got family, they've got other distractions. I, I think and we've heard even in the past teams say we need a road trip. That's where we bond with the players, because the only guys we have at that point are each other. So I think you're right, Matt. I think maybe getting these guys in the road is um 
it, 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 I think it's time to hit the road. Like, I think this team needs that. They're practicing a lot when they're at home. They're probably not going to practice at all on this road trip. So I think it might give them a little bit of chance to rest, recover, and figure out who they are. Yeah, and you look at, like, uh, Daryl, he said, like, teams normally go on, like, a seven-game homestand, and, you know, they don't play poorly during those necessarily. Um, like, the Flames have won a seven-game homestand in recent history. But I think just the a combination of, you know, not having any, uh, like, having too many new people in key positions... Um, not any travel even really during preseason because all the games were basically in our neck of the woods anyway. The one road game was to Edmonton, which that's not really a road trip. Uh, you know, like, it, there's not really been any time for this team to do anything but stay at home, whereas if, like, this homestand was halfway through the year... Like we'd be talking differently, and like maybe and the we've often go seen our long homestand, you know, early January through to kind of late January. Yeah, and usually they do well during those because you're already on a roll at that point. But it's it's like when it rains, it pours with this. Uh, when you're starting to have minor things screw up. It just snowballs, and everybody tightens up and tries too hard, which causes more mistakes. And, you know, it's like that. And, uh, and I think that's uh, what we were seeing near the end of the week. Like, when I look at that New Jersey game, I think what you just said is exactly what I was seeing. In the first period, it just seemed like they were fighting it. They were tightening up. They weren't playing their game. They are trying not to make a mistake. And I don't know what got said between the first and second period, but whatever it was, they came out and played a better Calgary Flames game. And I think, you know, it seemed like they just came out and played it their way instead of trying to worry about what was or wasn't going right. Yeah, well, it's like the game against uh, Buffalo where they managed, they were down 4-1, to one, managed to get within a goal, then gave up one, and then they just couldn't get anything going at all and like even just basic passes like 10 foot passes were beyond them and like the game basically ended at, as soon as that fifth goal was scored and you know it, it's one of those that like i know this team has high expectations and i i'm sure that the players have high expectations both for themselves and with each other but sometimes you just need to breathe, you know, and it's like the team's kind of like having like a mini panic attack and, it, it, you know, and it, nothing is going right. <laughs> no, I totally agree. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to dwell too much on where we're at and, you know, what is or isn't going well. We know it's going well. And I think the big question to me is, can they rebound on this road trip or does the losing continue? And if the losing continues, I think there's some other challenge there. Um, and, and that's when the flames are going to have to figure things out. Yeah. And uh, obviously like you're not going to see guys like Lindholm, like to fully like Huberto struggle all year. Like uh, they're too good of players where, like they will figure it out at some point. Like they're they they're not paid what they are because they're bad. You know, like they will turn around. It's just will it extremely, be yeah. Will it be too late? Is kind of what I've been wondering. Yeah, and it's one of those where like this team is really showing right now, and why this is actually not a bad thing if they do turn it around you're going to struggle right now is a good time because of the fact that like you look at the teams that they've lost to uh whether it's uh seattle or nashville or new jersey like those teams really aren't in playoff contention or in nashville's case like they're we're not going to play them so really unless it's like the we win the division and play them in the first round but um, it's one of those things where, like, it's clearly identifying that this team's missing a, a second line forward at a minimum. And it may be a depth defenseman, depending on how DeSimone and uh, well, let's, Milos and all them play let's later. Let's cover the forwards we'll, first. Yeah. 
The fact that number 17, I mean, and you know I'm a Lucic fan. I think he should be captain of this team. I've said that for a while. The fact that he's playing on our second line, is that not just showing the glaring hole that we have at, you know, top six wing? Yeah, and it's I mean, also, you and I talked about this going into the season, that that was their big weakness. Yeah, and it's like when uh, they sh- shook up the lines and you saw um, Dubé with Backlund and Coleman, like that, to me, should be the permanent third line. I agree. But you have to shoehorn Dubé into the top six, which he can play there, but it's one of those that like you're uh, creating a hole elsewhere just to shoehorn a guy up because you don't have anybody else. And like Lucic has played well, and he's the main one of the main reasons why the fourth line has been really effective this season, along with Richie's play. But it, it's one of those where like it's clearly evident that they need another scorer. Period. Uh, just. Anybody who can actually get the puck in the net. Um, I said to you during the preseason, I think when everything shakes down, Dylan Dubé will be the third line winger. And I think that's exactly yeah. where he deserves to be on this team right now. I'm not saying he's a bad player. Oh, no. But I just don't, uh, don't think that he's a top six guy right now. Yeah. And I could definitely see him becoming that second line winger or even a second line center down the road. It, it's just that for where we are now and where he's at right at the moment, like he's not quite up to that level. It, yeah. It's not dr- as drastic as putting Lewis on the third line where it's like, uh, you're clearly a fourth line borderline fourth line guy. And, but we have nobody else. And, well, and I mean, the way I'm looking at it too, like, you know, even in that uh, Seattle game, Kevin Rooney sat out and, mm-hmm. I would even be more willing to try Kevin Rooney. Not that I think he's a second line guy by any stretch, but I'd be more willing to try Kevin Rooney as a second line winger than, you know, think that Lucic or, or you know, Lewis or someone like that's going to work up there. Yeah, it it's just one of those things where it that's the frustrating part of the preseason. Like it, you had Balamaki, uh like the sixth spot really was open for business, whether it was Mackie or Valimaki or Stone or any of the three veteran guys. And Stone took it because he was adequately good as the number six. And literally none of the other players showed up at all um, to at a level to take that spot. And then you look at guys like Phillips, Peltier, uh, Zari, uh, the guy that they claimed redeems the Horna. Like, none of those guys, like, they were all given a spot, a chance to earn that spot. And, and I still none don't think you go it. to any of them for your top six. No, like, Phillips would literally be the only guy I would touch as a trying that out for the top six, just because he's a, the most dynamic offensive player on the, the Calgary Wranglers. I didn't say Stockton this time. Uh, <laughs> getting there anyhow, but, uh, like the rest of them just aren't quite there yet either. And like the Wranglers themselves have been rather poor to start the season and it, it's just and when, frustrating. When I look at the other guys who are in our, you know, let's call them bottom six and reserve forwards, I guess I look at if, if we're not going to make a trade and we'll talk about this in a little bit when we get to the back end, we really have no money right now. And I don't think we want to ship out assets. So looking at who's on the team, if not 17, who? And that's where, like, why I I mentioned Phillips being, like, pretty much the only guy that's playing at a level. Like, even though he's tiny, uh, if he continues to play well in Stockton, I think you got, or see, I just did that. It, playing well with the Wranglers that uh, he will just by necessity we need a top six forward he's the dynamic guy on the Wranglers so let's see if he can take that spot or not and and even I, right now we can't afford to bring him up no and so I mean looking at who's here I mean what do you do I would almost say the next guy up would be Blake Coleman. Yeah. 
I mean, I, not I'd maybe even not try, your solve. Yeah, I might even try Rujitska just for. He's struggled uh, to get, even get in the lineup. I don't know if you go from not uh, being in the lineup to top six. I know. It's one of those where... I think if you move Coleman up to two, you could then put Rajishka on three and see what he does there, but I don't think you can bring um, Adam all the way up to second line right away. I know. It's trying to fit a square peg in a round hole at this point, and none of them seem to be... The only other thing you could maybe do, and, and again, not the solve, but... Just looking at personnel, Kadri or Backlund plays wing. Yeah, but then you're but then you're really weakening yourself down the center. Yeah, because like if you put those guys on the wing, then like you kind of have to shift Dubé over to center. Well, I, uh, I think you could do let's say Kadri at center, Backlund at left wing, Dubé goes down to the third line, Rooney becomes the center there. So it'd be say Coleman, Rooney. Uh, or let's say Coleman, yeah, Rooney, Dubé, and then Lewis, Lucic, and Rajichka. Yeah. It's kind of a mess, and it doesn't really solve anything. It might get you what you need for a game or two, but we all know yeah. that Michael Michael Backlund's not going to be a left wing, neither is, you know, Kadri for the rest of the year. Yeah, it, it, it's really tough because, like, if guys like Lindholm and Huberdeau were not struggling to the depth that they are and were just even producing at, like, pre-last year's levels, um, like, the Flames probably have another two wins, uh, frankly, if just those two players were contributing more. And it's hard when... You know, like a guy that scores 42 goals for you last year, I don't even think he has one yet thus far. And it's it gets just even that much more difficult. Which guy are you talking about, Huberdeau? Lindholm. Oh, Lindholm. Yeah, I don't think he has... I think he's got a couple assists. Let me just take a look. But I don't think he's got one goal yet. Um, oh, no, he does. Okay, so he's got three goals, three assists. Yeah. He just doesn't seem to be uh, performing no. anywhere near his level, though. And No, he doesn't. Yeah. Why don't we move to the back end and some of the woes there? Because I think those are the bigger woes right now. In the New Jersey game, Michael Stone, who's been a reliable number six for us, played less than a minute before he left the game injured. As of the next day, today, Sunday, he's been placed on the injury reserve. And uh, that means the Flames have some, well, issues on the back end. Um, Tanev's out. Stone is on IR. We have no idea where Shillington is. Still hasn't reported to the team. So that really gives us four healthy defensemen, Hannafin, Anderson, Uyghur, Zadorov. So before going on this New York road trip, the Calgary Flames called up two defensemen from the farm, Nick DeSimone and Dennis Gilbert. Just a rundown on these two guys for those that don't know them. Nick DeSimone is 27. He's never played an NHL game. He's six foot two, 185 pound right-handed defender who has one goal and six points. Well, he generally has been used to power play the quarterback in eight games with the Wranglers this season. Gilbert's 26. He's appeared in 25 NHL games with Chicago and Colorado. Uh, he's 6'2", 216, and he's a lefty. He does not have a point in eight games with the Wranglers this year, although he's been primarily used in a shutdown role. So, Matt, I think we're kind of screwed. It, it's one of those where uh, those guys will be getting an opportunity really soon. Well, and... okay, so that's an interesting point there. So after the way Connor Mackey looked against New Jersey, you know that both these guys are going to be put into the 5-6 spot. Do you yeah. think that there might now be once, you know, let, let's say once Stone's back or Tana's back, whoever comes back first, do you think that we will see Gilbert or D. Simone stay and Mackey go down? Yeah, uh, I think that Mackey's time as the flame. Unless these guys look really stinky. Like, I think this is now their chance to win a spot on the roster after Mackey's poor game. Yeah, Uh, uh, frankly, like, I don't think you'll see Mackey play another game for the Flames this season. Um, No, these guys have to be really poor to have one of them not become seven. Yeah, and I think that you would just kind of ride one or both of those guys in the lineup until Stone and Tanev are back. 
And then if you need like a number seven, then just put all three of those guys on waivers back to to the farm. And if anybody that's even remotely decent as a seventh defenseman comes available on waivers, pick them up just for that role. And yeah, and I don't think D. Simone or Gilbert, unless they're for more than thirty days, have to clear now. Yeah, uh, we just both... don't know the full extent of no, Stone or uh, Tanev's injury. But Tanev so... hasn't been placed on the IR, which I think is a good sign. Stone's on the IR, which means out at least a week. The fact that they haven't placed Tanev on the IR, I think, is a good sign. Yeah, I agree. Because especially now, the Calgary Flames now have sixty two thousand two hundred and forty three dollars in cap room. I think if you thought ten of would be out for more than a week, you'd put him on the IR just to clear up some cap room. Yeah. It'll so, be interesting to see. Like the team's kind of in a weird spot right now. You know, and going into the season, I mean when we looked at it, we thought, wow, defensive depth is gonna be a strength of this team, and then they lost Valamaki. And we still don't know where Shillington is. And now, really, our pairs for this uh, Eastern road trip are probably going to be Anderson, or uh, Hannafin, Anderson, Uyghur, Zadorov, Gilbert, D. Simone. Like the first two are good, but D. Simone and Gilbert, I, I'm a little bit worried. Uh, I think remind, you, you can have one of those guys of, in the lineup. Flashbacks of Forbort Gustafson back in the day. Yeah, uh, and, and you know, if it was one of those guys with Stone or one of those guys with Tanev or one of those guys with Zadorov, fine. But I'm worried that the two of them are up there together. Yeah, well, I think what you're going to end up seeing is uh, Hannafin and Anderson and uh, Uyghur Zadorov are probably going to play 23, 24 minutes each. And then the other guy's getting like 10 minutes. Well, and I was even looking at that. Do you break up Uyghur Zadorov and go like Uyghur, D. Simone, Zadorov, Gilbert? But I don't think you can give Simone that much time, D. Simone or Gilbert. No. Uh, it, yeah, you might see that um, a bit, but uh, like uh, I think that you might see um, like a shift where, say, Uyghur's with D. Simone, then Zadorov's with uh, Gilbert, then Uyghurs with Zadorov, then they reset with the first pair, and then they go back, like, shake it up, so that way, like, a shift the, uh, for the second pairing gets used with just the veterans and, you know, skip the third pairing entirely and go back to the first. And the fact that Gilbert D. Simone have been used in, I had to stop myself there, in Calgary AHL as a uh, shutdown pair... I wonder if you'd even see them if the Flames are up in a game, get some PK time. Uh, I I think that unless uh, the Flames are two men down and two of the guys are two of the defensemen, <laughs> I I I don't think you'd see either of them touch the ice. And even then, it'd be like uh, which of the forwards can play defense. <laughs> Just, well, and that's uh, it. Like when I look at this, if we lose another defenseman, we've got. Nick Malosh and Connor Pullman, who are pro, or Colton Pullman, who are probably next up. Like you're not bringing Poirier up, you're not bringing Kuznetsov up. Um, uh, I those... think that like after um, uh, the first two, then I think you have to go with Kuznetsov, then uh, Poirier. Or do you and call that, Fried and, and Kurt, Chris Russell and try to sign him? Yeah. Well, then it's like, um, can is there such a thing as an emergency backup defenseman? <laughs> Yeah. Chris Russell. Hey, random dude off the street. Hey, here's a jersey. Go stop Sidney Crosby. You know, it's like, yay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, no. it's, I don't know. I mean, nothing against Gilbert or Simone, but, and like I said, one of them in the lineup would probably be fine, but two of them I'm a little bit worried about. Yeah, and like if it, if Mackey didn't play so spectacularly bad against New Jersey, I think that you would see Mackey with one of those two. For sure. But I think with, they still would have called them both up so they have seven guys. Yeah, but I think that with the it, how bad Mackey played, that I'm assuming that the two uh, new call-ups will get in. Oh, I think you're right. Yeah, I think Mackey, like you said, could have played his last game in a Flames jersey. Not that he might not get called up again to be a number seven or something uh, later in the year, but I think right now Mackey needs to play and figure out whatever's going on, and... <sighs> He can stay here in Calgary and do it just at the AHL level. Yeah, well, like uh, Sutter was saying earlier this season when um, Mackey first drew in against Buffalo, 
where like if you're given given an opportunity like you actually have to step up and take it and he failed in each of the games that he's played and yeah. it's you know like it, it's just not working and it's not a slight on him it's just you know he's not playing out an NHL level and it's a detriment and to I was the team. honestly kind of- I was honestly kind of surprised he was here to start the year, but I guess when I'm looking at it in my head, if Shillington was here, I don't think Mackie would be. I think Mackie was no. the next guy up to be number seven, and that's why he was here. Yeah, well, and plus you have to reward guys that played well the previous season, and, like, he didn't look terrible. Like, there, none of the four guys uh, between Milos, De Simone, Gilbert, and him uh, took the ball and ran with it, so... He, with him being like still quote unquote a prospect, even though he's 25, it's like, okay, well, we're giving you the shot because really, like, if you're ever going to be an NHLer, you have to show it now. And for the three games, like, he's not been very good. You and know, of those. Of those four guys, though, I think they're probably all career AHL guys. Yeah, I agree. Maybe too. a number seven on a poor team. Yeah, I agree. I think all four but, of them could be number sevens on poor teams, but you know, uh, you can I, say I that about a I'd lot say of. I never say this, Matt, but I really miss uh, Yusuf Alamaki right now. Uh, I'm not. I'm glad that he's doing well. I mean, for yeah, it's good. He's, in it's good he's playing where he is, but I think you know he was an adequate enough guy that he could step in to that number seven role and right now. And honestly, you know, like if he was here, I do not think that he'd be playing significantly better than what Mackey's brought. So, like, it, it, like he hasn't been great in Arizona. He's been okay. But, you know, for, you know, like, you're, you're playing in the NHL, and so if you're okay, that's at least something, especially for the Coyotes. But, you know, it, there, there's a lot of difference between being an okay player for the coyotes and the, uh, an okay player for us, uh, where we're trying to be. So yeah, uh, let's just hope that we get Tanev back fairly soon. And I, I guess the big reason I'm worried about Tanev again is we know he was out during the playoffs and now he's out again. Like, is this the same injury? We really don't know what's going on with Tanev. Is there something there that, you know, is going to be negative for a couple of years? Like, I guess I'm, I'm just worried about, yeah, what's going on there? Especially after the after he was out for the playoffs. Well, and the thing is that um, the one good thing about Tanev is that he's not an overly skilled offensive defenseman. So, uh, like, if his shoulder is bothering him and he can't shoot the puck quite as hard or effectively, you're not really going to notice much of a difference just due to the fact that it's not his game. So, you know, so you're kind of saying even if they put him back at 80 or 90 percent. Well, as long as he's able to physically do the job without like further injuring himself, I don't see why not. His bread and butter has never been the offensive side of the game. No, that's that's true. Um, yeah, I just I don't want to rush him back in there because that could do more long term damage. Oh, I agree. You know, and I think, and I mentioned you this before we started recording, I think us and all the Calgary Flames media have been trying to be respectful of Oliver Shillington and whatever's going on there that's keeping him away from the team. But right now, I think it's, and I don't want to say fair for the media, but I think it's going to be time the media starts asking, where is he and when is he coming back? Yeah, and at least like give an idea of, what the nature of the problem is. and Even you know, if you don't do that, I think even if you say he's dealing with something, he won't be back till January, or he won't be back this season. Yeah, like, that's what I mean. Like, you know, you can even just elaborate saying, like, it's a personal issue or whatever, or a family issue, but, like, there's been no guidance because, hey, like, you know, and, like, you and I and everybody else respects him as a person and as a player and what's the best for him. So like, you know, you don't need to needle the guy until, you know, you get something from him. But 
it, it's one of those things where, like, even just an idea of what might the problem be, just to get the chatter to not be, you know, like, especially in the current situation that the Flames are in. Well, and I think even just looking at it from a cap standpoint, I mean, he's still counting against the Calgary Flames salary cap, and he got a nice new contract this year. Um, I don't think he's been officially put on the IR. Maybe he has. Um, but if he hasn't, okay, so he is showing on the IR. So I was going to say, if he's if he's on the IR, great. Then we get a little bit of cap relief there. But if not, let's do what we got to do with the league to get him there. But, I mean, you know, going into the season, we expected six really good defensemen. And now that we're down to, you know, four, we really need Shillington back or at least – you know, the GM needs to maybe, and I don't know, I have a feeling they're probably saying to Sheldon, let us know when you're ready to come back. Maybe now Brad's got to call him and say, look, do we move forward on our blue line without you? Or when are you going to be back? Because $2.5 million is a lot of money to spend on a blue liner that's not here. And you could go out and acquire somebody to fill that hole better than D. Simone or uh, Gilbert if we need to. Whether that's through trade, there's still a few free agent names. So I think you've really got to know, is this guy going to be joining us or is he out for the year? Because two, $2.5 million could really help us. Well, it's one of those things where it's hard to manage, you know, like the off-ice issues, whatever they are, and, and like what's good for both the player and team. And because, like, clearly it's not a linear situation of, like, oh, I broke my arm, I have to wait X amount of games or days until I can shoot the puck, this, that, whatever. And, it, you know, like, whether he's having difficulties rehabbing from his injuries that he suffered at the end of last season. I think the Flames have said it's a personal family issue. Yeah. It, it, it's just one of those where it's hard because, you know, just the whole situation and circumstances suck, frankly. And... You know, like, would he be perfect to be have back? Yes, but, you know, it, it, the whole thing just, it, it's tough because there is no specifics, really, from the other side where, like, you know, like, if the f fan base knew that, like, oh, he was suffering from addiction or depression or this or that or whatever, it, you know, like, the fan base would be like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Cool. Or he's there you, with you, grandma on her deathbed or something like that. Yeah, like, you do you, man. Great, you know, we got you. We're not going to harass you any further. It's just, we And to me, it. I don't even care what he's out with, really. Just tell me when to expect him back. Like, hey, he's dealing with something in Sweden. He'll be back in January. Okay, now we know how to get from here to there. And as fans, we have some idea of what to expect in media. We have some idea of what to expect. But when he's yeah. just not around uh, for whatever reason... It's like, well, and I don't even know if the, you know, if the Flames know, but, and I know they're probably not going to go out and buy a free agent at this point, but even if I look around, Danny DeKaiser, Thomas Hickey, Chris Russell, all free agents, all probably better than the two guys that we just recalled in, you know, D. Simone, Gilbert, and let's put Mackey in there. Like, if you need a, a, a number seven, I'd probably call DeKaiser. Yeah. Or Russell. Or Hickey, like any of those, really. Yeah, I mean, for I like don't want one them, year, one yeah, year seven hundred k, like sure. I don't want fine. them to be in my top five, but if I just if I'm hey, I'm without a body, I bet you get any of those guys for league minimum at this point, or someone yeah. who's gone waivers who's good enough. But I just think right now they got no money. But if they know what they've got or what they don't, then they can plan accordingly. Yeah, it, it's just bad luck and bad timing with the injuries and. The circumstances but i'm sure that the team like if things were more significant like with stone uh well, like say he's missing a month just to say uh, i think that you would see the flames like start actively talking with the camps of those particular free agents just as uh well hey you know uh <laughs> we're kind of screwed right at the moment um, yeah, and, you, know, you know, I mean, I wouldn't want to put one of those guys right on the NHL roster if we could avoid it. I think I'd want them to get some AHL time. So you had to say, I'm just making up a name here. D. Simone is good enough for three weeks while we take the Kaiser, get him some play time in the A. If he, you know, if he can clear waivers. Yeah, I agree. Which I have a feeling he would. If somebody wanted him, they'd have him by now. Exactly. Um, 
Yeah, yeah it's I, just I, a I, tough situation because of the open endedness on all fronts, whether you're talking like the injuries itself. Well, and just how players. many defensemen were down. Yeah. We're down oh, no. three defensemen. Yeah, like it, it's tough when, you know, like you're having expectations of like Stone being the number seven and like guys like Mackey and the rest of them being the eight through 12 guys to all of a sudden like having multiples of those guys in the lineup. It's uh, tough. And, and I think teams need eight defensemen during the year. And I expect D. Simone and Gilbert to both play, just not together. Like I expected, mm-hmm. you know, okay, Stone's out, D. Simone's in. Then maybe Zadorov's out, Gilbert's in, you know, same thing with Malosh. Like, I kind of expect us to rotate out kind of three or four guys at that number eight spot during the year. Yeah, I just didn't and expect especially them all with to the, get in the lineup at once. Yeah, well, especially with the farm team being just down the hall, that it makes life a lot easier in that regard. But it, it's just a bad situation at the moment, and... No definitive guy on the farm where you're going, oh, well, you're clearly the next in line. So And, and I feel know. bad for Wranglers fans right now because they've really got nobody left on the blue line for this week. Yeah, so forwards, uh, you know, you're a spare forward right at the moment. Sure, you're going to be the third-pairing defenseman. And well, I, I I think at that point you call someone up for Rapid City or something like that. But, yeah. um, you know, even then it's not going to be necessarily the best guys you could get, right? I mean, there's a big difference oh, yeah. in the hockey level between the AHL and the ECHL. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, that's why, like, you see, like, basically anybody that graduates from the ECHL is generally a goaltender just because of the fact that it, the forwards and the defense are kind of, you know, like, Mackenzie Wieger being from the E is a outlier. Like, I remember at one point, like, Alex Burroughs was literally the only non-goalie uh, to ever play in the E uh, that actually is in the NHL. Back like when like Vancouver was really good at that point, and nothing really has changed. Where like if you're not a goaltender and you're in the ECHL, your NHL future is not <laughs> likely. Okay, so I'm just looking here. They do have two Wranglers contracted defensemen who are playing in Rapid City right now, and Simon Levine and Rhett Reinhardt. So both those guys, I mean. Obviously, they're in the ECHL for a reason, but that becomes an easy transition then to just bring Reinhardt and Levine back up. Yeah. But we're not a Wrangler show. We won't uh, dissect the Wranglers and the Rush moves. Yeah. So, Matt, I guess with that, um, it's anything else Flames-related you want to talk about before we look ahead to the next week? Oh, well, it's just uh, one of those frustrating times where like, the team played so well against all the really good teams, then they're playing some mediocre teams, and they struggle heavily. And it's the same story that we've heard for years. And it's like, is this team, like, especially over, like, the span of the road trip, most of the teams that the Flames face are not on the good side of things. So are their struggles going to keep manifesting because they're playing weaker opponents? Yeah, and, you know, you and I have had this debate for years and years and years. You know, yes, the team looks good on paper. They're, for some reason, not performing on the ice the way they should. And I really think that this road trip is going to tell us if this Calgary Flames team with different personnel is a different team or if they're just going to fall in the same trap we've seen them fall into before. Yeah, because, like, uh, frankly, like, if this team, like, say Lindholm continues to struggle and Huberdeau continues to struggle, like, this team is more or less, like, kind of walking its way into a rebuild, even though you're not officially going that route. Um, And because, you know, like, if those guys don't play at their normal level, like this team is paper thin. At well, that's that point. it. You got nobody else. What are you going to have? Dylan Dubé and and uh, Brett Ritchie as your top two offensive guys? Yeah, like that's just not sustainable. And you know whether like Zari or Peltier or Phillips can fill in or Coronado next year uh, from the NCAA. If any of those guys can step in, but like that's a huge question mark, and they haven't really seized any of the opportunities yet. So and the fact that. 
the Wranglers are not looking nearly as good as the Heat did this time last year, I think brings that into question even more. Yeah, and they did lose a handful of veteran guys, and you know they're playing poorly because of that. And it's just, it'll be interesting to see. Like, um, Zari and Phillips have both looked excellent, but that's not really enough. And like this team, you know, like if that's all you're getting out of this team is this level of inconsistency and you know just mediocrity, like the you're going to have to start like changing your focus away from like contender mode team to potential, you know, retooling, whether it's a rebuild or otherwise. And it'll be interesting to see and frustrating. Well, you let's know, not spell doom out. and gloom yet. We've yeah. only, we're, we're only 10 games in an 82 game season. There's still lots of time to see what these Calgary flames are. Uh, yep. Last year, you and I, or last week, you and I didn't get our predictions right. We both predicted two wins, just a different two wins. Obviously, yeah. we got zero wins. We got one point out of the whole week. And this is going to be a busy week for the Flames. They've got four games this week, three on the road, one at home. Um, Monday night, they will play the New York Islanders in Long Island. That's a 5 p.m. mountain start. Tuesday, 5 p.m. mountain start at New Jersey, a chance to get some revenge. And then Thursday, they're at Boston. Again, a 5 p.m. start. Then they'll come back here for a Saturday game in the Saldome against the Winnipeg Jets, an 8 p.m. start. So, Matt, four games in the docket. How are you going to predict this one? I'm going to go one and three. Which one? Uh, the Winnipeg game. You sure expect another tough week for this team? Yep. Why? Uh, they haven't really shown enough signs of life yet. Interesting. And and it, 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 it's one of those where, like, it, it, the pessimist in me says one and three, and the optimist says three and one. And I think it's a, pretty much a coin toss that'll be one or the other at this point. I'm going to split the difference between those. I'm going to go two and two. I think, we, like you said, we haven't seen enough signs of life. I don't think they win the Islanders game. I think playing back-to-back -back is not going to help them in New Jersey. But I think that they can take the Boston game and the Winnipeg game if they can get their acts together. I think they need those New York and New Jersey games, though, to get back to where they were. So I'm going to go 2-2. Two and two. I'm going to say they win Boston and Winnipeg this week. Yeah. Daryl Sutter wants to play Dan Vladar once a week. Where do you play Vladar? Um, possibly the Devils game. I'd play possibly the, the Jets game. game. Um, with how with how good Markstrom's looked, I don't want to burn him out. And you got a back to back. That's traditionally where you play your backup. I don't think we're at the point in the season yet where we need to be playing our starter two games in a row, two nights. Yeah, in a row. I agree. So I think I and I really don't care which one of those. I'd play Vladar either New York or New Jersey, but it just seems like it makes more sense to give New Jersey a different look after just seeing Vladar what four days earlier. So that's what I would do is play Dan Vladar in New Jersey and then play Jacob Markstrom for the other three. You know that Markstrom's probably going to play um, the Winnipeg game when they're back home. Yeah. The only um, other the only other thing might be play Vladar against Boston since we got him from Boston. I mean, he never really was a really that much of a Bruin per se, but you could also play him in the Boston game. I just that's not the game I'd want to put him in net for. No, like that's not really being fair to Vladar just because Boston's the best team in the NHL right now. Well, that's it. That's why I wouldn't do it. If they were not as good, I might. But I think you need Markstrom and net against the Bruins. Yeah. It, it's going to be an interesting week because like, none of the opponents this week are particularly a pushover, but three of the four aren't particularly good either. So we'll see. Which I think is, you know, is good and bad. I think with the way the Flames are playing right now, they need some games to sort of reset. And I think the fact that, let's be honest, we probably got the the worst two teams at the beginning of the week and the better two teams at the end of the week. And I think that's maybe what they need right now is just that ability to have all the, you know, two more games to work through their issues before they take on some better teams. Yeah, I agree. And... Uh, you know, even beyond this week, like mo they're right back on the road again. Yeah, they have uh, Winnipeg and LA at home, and then on the 17th, they're on the road for yeah, I think, a week and a half. 
yeah, going all through Florida Six games. and yeah. like that whole coast. So yeah, Tampa Bay, Florida, Philly, Pittsburgh, Washington, Carolina. Yeah, so like not an easy road trip after this. So like they really have to got to build some confidence. Yeah, get their act together quite a bit. And we saw this a little bit with Vancouver to start the season, where like they just had everything going wrong for them and now they've won three in a row or four in a row something like that and are rebounding from like an 05 and 2 start so it it's just going to be come down to progress and if these guys can figure out how to string passes together cohesively and like where people are supposed to be and all that kind of stuff I think you kind of hinted at earlier but I feel like once the flames have one good game things are going to click again I agree like it yeah. just feels and like they're they just need something to go in. Yeah. Either that or like get skunked. I think either way. Like if they get skunked like say nine one against Boston or something stupid like that, I could see the team rallying from that of going, Well, that was a colossal screw up and we don't like losing like that, so let's you know but I think you've already had those times. I mean when you lose to Seattle, I think you have that same discussion. True. So yeah. I, I think, it's and nothing's so it's when easy. When you get those big losses, you just get down on yourself. I think these guys need a win, and they need to get back to their identity in that win. Well, Matt, that uh, that wraps us up for this week. So hopefully, we will come back talking about good news next week, and let's say hopefully a 500 week for the Flames um, between the three road trips and one home game. But I know yeah. you're still going to be cheering for the Flames this week. What are you going to be cheering all week, man? Uh, well, I do have to uh, add one minor like out of uh, town thing uh, before signing off, and that's uh, not very impressed with the Boston Bruins and their whole handling of the um, signing of that prospect uh, that they did this week. Uh, I think that's a very big black mark on the organization and the league in general. So uh, just not impressed with their handling of that and doing their due diligence. Um, I thought you are going to bring up the fact that Kachuk's not our problem anymore now. He's suspended for two games. Well, uh, yeah. Those guys let's, are Let's kinda, not get into the politics yeah. of what's going on in Boston. I know. It, it's just, it, it was one of those I had to mention it, just personally. Anyhow, um, as always, Go Flames Go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.